Ready? Okay, guys. Yep. See ya. describe your home and family when you were growing up? Um, I'd say I was very lucky growing up uh, to be raised in a home that uh, was filled with love and compassion. Um, I was lucky that my mom was able to take off of work uh, for the first few, few years that I was alive and just be a stay-at-home mom to take care of me. Um, and uh, one of the big parts of uh, our family was having foster kids. Mm -hmm. We'd had over 70 foster kids throughout the years. And uh, so kind of having um, uh, different experiences with all of those kids and their unique personalities and experiences definitely uh, impacted all of us and how uh, we look at life. and. Uh, it, yeah, I think it definitely molded me a lot and who I am and how I look at people and uh, try to, to see how different all of our situations really are and how much uh, our family life and uh, the circumstances that we've been through impact who we are. So, that's what did you want to be when you were a child? Um, I think I always had a, a desire to be an inventor. Um, I still do. Uh, there is definitely uh, things in my mind that roll around uh, where I'd like to make something that's useful for people. Um, so um, I have, you know, some scribblings that I've drawn out here and there, diagrams of little ideas. Uh, but nothing's ever really come far enough to ever be developed in any certain, any, even with a prototype. So, okay. yeah, I wish that I would have come up with something along the way. What's your favorite movie and why? Um, so the movie that, uh, the reason that this is my favorite movie is because it's, had uh, an impact on my life and how I view the world is um, uh, Schindler's List. And really it comes down to kind of that final scene with Liam Neeson and uh, he's talking with uh, some of the people that he saved from the Holocaust. And he just begins to break down uh, looking at some of the possessions that he has held on to that have value in this world and realizing um, perhaps the human value that it cost to keep them, to hold on to them. Uh, and just that, that broken heartedness of the willingness to sacrifice for others to say, you know, this gold pen is not worth two lives, this car is not worth 10 people's lives uh, really impacted me in the way that I uh, perceive how uh, I should be with uh, my life, with my finances, with how I treat others, that possessions should never come before people, um, that we should have a goal to strive towards loving others and you know, he, he definitely gets a lot of compassion from the people who are around him at the, in the end of that scene saying, well, no, you, you needed those things in order to, to keep the charade going, uh, to trick the government uh, to allow you to save us, you know? So it's not all about, um, we'll have to give up everything for everybody else, but it's finding that balance of uh, how much do I hold on to in order to be the most productive in society with uh, giving compassion and love towards others and, and raising the value of life or saving other people's lives even. I, I think a lot of us in our current uh, culture and our current day and age, we have access to uh, information around the world of people who are struggling and yet it still st still feels so far removed from us that 
we feel like we can't do anything, but we are in such a unique position to be able to do things for others, and we need to be more diligent and take that at heart. If you were able to travel, where would you like to go and why? Um, well, I, I've loved traveling the few destinations in the world I've been able to go, like India and El Salvador and Mexico and Canada. For me, uh, the Philippines, uh, the best part of all those journeys has always been about the people. And uh, the experiences that I've gotten to live through other people's lives in those areas, even though only for short amounts of time, getting to see how someone else in a different part of the world lives with, with uh, different uh, monetary you know, uh, incomes, with different uh, assets, with different uh, things available to them, and how uh, joyous people are in life even without all of those uh, things. Um, so for me, again, the places that I would love to visit come down to the people and why they're there. And so for right now, that's the Philippines because of uh, my wife's family and, and her background being from the Philippines. I would love to go see her family again and spend time with them and um, just get to know their lives better and and experience how they've lived because it's very different from how I've lived. Um, even though I have been there before, there are uh, lots of things that you forget about uh, when you're here, uh, about how easy it is to go get a glass of water, about how easy it is to um, just take a hot shower if you're not feeling quite well, or um, how easy it is to just have access to food as much food really as we want. Uh, it's it's uh, humbling to be in that position where uh, you really have to work for all of those things and everything takes a little bit extra effort, a little bit extra time, a little bit extra thought. And uh, yeah, so yeah. Philippines. What has been your biggest accomplishment? Um, I think my biggest accomplishment has been my relationships. Uh, so first and foremost with my wife, uh, the development of that relationship and the time and effort that it's taken to develop the trust and the love and uh, all that goes into a relationship. And then also with friends and family, um, you know, a, there's so often times that we make it through the end of a hard time or a difficult time and we get to look back at that and then hold each other's hands and say, you know what, like we made it through that hard time, like how much easier is the next one going to be? And uh, having those relationships that uh, grow stronger over time, um, I don't know what greater accomplishment there could be really. What's been your biggest disappointment? Um, so hand in hand with the greatest accomplishment is relationships uh, and how I feel I've uh, let others down or uh, disappointed others in, in relationship. So I feel like one of the things that uh, I've struggled always with is uh, to convey with enough energy or with enough emotion uh, how much I care about the people who are around me and also in the times where they've you know uh, gone above and beyond and tried you know given me a gift or try to create an experience for me um, where I feel like I've let them down without being you know I haven't been exuberant enough to express how happy they've made me or how joyful they've made me in that moment and uh, I wish that I could have done better at that. I also feel that part of that is you know uh, I've always struggled with this vein of of uh, criticism or negative thought even when when it comes to things where 
I will evaluate first instead of um, appreciate first. And uh, I wish that I would have gotten better at flipping that around where I could have appreciated first and then maybe later on in my own private time evaluated uh, just for my own benefit, if, if you will. What's your biggest regret? Um, I think that it, it's a, a tough question because I don't think I've done anything where I will say, um, I wish I hadn't ever done that and I would be in a different place in my life now because who knows how my life would have turned out if I hadn't. Um, but um, I really regret kind of college, <laughs> the amount of finances that went into it, the amount of time that went into it that I don't think I got as much benefit out of it as I thought I would have. Um, true, there, true, there were definite benefits. There were good things that came out of it. There were good relationships and learning opportunities and all of those things, but I, don't, I think that the financial cost and the time toll definitely outweighed um, what was the intended purpose of it. What do you remember about being told you have cancer? Um, I remember it was kind of, uh, oh yeah, we kind of didn't want to tell you right away. Um, so when I first got out of surgery, the doctor came in and talked to me about what they had done in the operation. Um, and that was a few days after. Uh, so they didn't, uh, my my wife and family hadn't told me that they had already uh, told them that there was cancer, so I hadn't heard that yet. So the the surgeon was the first one to to tell me that there was cancer. Um, it was just very surreal. Uh, it was you know all of it seemed kind of like a dream. It still kind of does. Mm -hmm. It's happened very fast, and. Um, there's a good part to that because it doesn't mean I, it means I haven't had too much time to over process because I definitely can do that. But at the same time, uh, it's, you know, given me just enough time to be able to appreciate and I think focus on the important things. So since you were told, what do you spend most of your time thinking about? Um... I think I spend most of my time thinking about mm, what can I do to make sure that my wife is prepared, to make sure that my family is prepared, that my friends are prepared. Um, and then beyond that, it's kind of spending time thinking about how um, I I don't know, can leave a legacy of some kind with them. Um, you know, I've had lots of goals and dreams throughout my life as far as, uh, you know, retiring in the Philippines maybe one day and um, maybe helping with an orphanage or doing something along the lines of just taking in kids to help in that situation. Um, helping um, my wife's family, helping my family, helping my friends, you know, uh, there's a lot of dreams that I've had as far as aspirations of uh, what the church looks like and the relationships between church members. And um, there, there's really a lot rolled into that. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot about politics with my friends and religion with my friends and theology and then kind of talking even about what's even important in those discussions, you know, should we even spend time on some of these? Um, are they really, you know, are we being mindful of, of our time and where we spend it? What do you think cancer has taught you? Um, I 
guess I don't want to give the credit to cancer because it's just a, a thing, but the, the potential knowledge of knowing that you're going to die sooner than you thought you were um, puts you in a unique position to reevaluate and refocus your priorities and again where you spend your time and what you want to make sure is done at the end of the day or at the end of the week. What can people do to provide you with emotional comfort? Um, I think right now it's exactly what we were just talking about kind of off, mm -hmm. off camera. Um, uh, just the realization of uh, being around you know, is, is all that's needed. Uh, you know, sometimes we get in such of a, a desire to look for the need and see this need and like, how can I serve? And, and it's, it's great. It, that's, it's nice to not have to constantly uh, have to find ways to do everything for yourself. But when you can just sit in comfort with each other and, and listen, listen to each other's hearts and um, just uh, talk with each other where there's no animosity or frustration or concerns um, and it's just relaxed. Uh, yeah, just knowing that people are there without uh, that. And I feel like I haven't quite nailed that one down yet. But. But, you know, I think too that if you um, are spending your time thinking about what you're going to say next mm -hmm. when you're with people, mm -hmm then you're going to miss it all. Mm -hmm. But like you said, listening, yep. if you just sit there and listen, you won't miss anything. Right. And maybe there'll be no words for right. a long time. Sure. And there don't have to be. Yeah, and it's um, sitting with this moment right here. Like, let's not worry about tomorrow yet. Let's mm -hmm. not worry about next week. Let's have this moment together right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are things that that need to be done for tomorrow, but you know, make sure that the majority of our time is spent here now, um, creating this memory together, where we're having fun or you know, uh, having a having a nice disagreement over okay. something. You know, allow it. Yeah. This is what we have is now. Right. The, the future and the and, and the past are not what we're looking at. We're looking at right now. Yes. Yep. What do you know about heaven? Little to nothing. Okay. okay. And I think um, it's important for uh, me as a follower of Jesus, as a believer in the, the Bible, and uh, someone who professes to be a Christian, to be able to admit that there are a lot of things that I do not know about God, about heaven, about hell, about many things in the Bible, and that it's okay. Um, a lot of times we convince ourselves that the knowledge puts us in a better standing with the people who are around us who are also Christians or believers. But in reality, it actually detracts us from our true missions and goals. And we end up spending so much time focusing on minute details that are of little consequence. Um, whereas the here and now are of importance. They are of relevance. Uh, relevance. And um, I don't want to spend my time focusing on what heaven might be and just be guessing. I mean, it might be a fun story, but the reality is there's not going to be much truth wrapped up into it. So I guess what I've confined my hope to be of what heaven is, is where I, the essence of my loving spirit and my joy and my peace, all those things that I've viewed as being characteristics of God, will be joined with God, and I'll be that for eternity. Beyond that, who knows? In hell. 
lots of time to learn. Right. It won't be a time of just sitting around. Yeah. You have all kinds of opportunities to talk to anybody. Mm. In the Bible, that you kind of has caught your eye. Or who would you want to talk to first besides Jesus and God? You have a, a special Bible character that you've always been fascinated by? Man, that was a tough one. Um, I'm not sure that I had wrestled to an answer on that as far okay. as a biblical character. Okay. Um, it, interestingly enough, I think the one that actually pops into my head first is Judas Iscariot. Okay. But obviously he wouldn't be in the heaven context potentially. So. But the knowledge about him would be. Right. So... Uh, maybe trying to understand what happened mm -hmm. in that situation because that's a very confusing aspect mm -hmm. of uh man he was right next to jesus he was following jesus he was a disciple of jesus he got to see healings like mm -hmm. i feel like if i had had that experience in life uh, you know how obvious would things kind of be and to him for him to have had that and to still betray the one that he claimed to love mm -hmm. that's interesting what unfinished business is most important to you um there's a lot uh, and as you think about it mm -hmm. is there something that people could do to help with that unfinished business uh, I think yes, um, that's part of the unfinished business is expressing to others mm -hmm. what the unfinished business is. Um, so I'll try and break it apart a little bit here and start just with my wife. Um, you know, there's many goals and dreams that we've left unaccomplished with each other at this point. And, you know, some of those would be uh, Maganda World, the charity that we started. Um, some of those are uh, helping her sisters finish school. Um, some of those are helping her family just to be in a financially stable position or a position where they're in a, they have the ability to turn and help others. Uh, so... With my wife specifically, you know, it's still thinking about the unfinished business of getting passwords and, you know, login information and all those little bits of information still passed out to her. Um, but then uh, to family and friends, it's the unfinished business of um, all the long hours of talks we've spent talking about maybe what church should look like. Um, and maybe where our resources as churches should be going, um, maybe where our time as churches should be going. Do we, are we really focused on the right things? Um, we have a very, um, interesting view of what the church should be here in a very wealthy country where we get to have buildings and pastors who are paid and um, live worship bands who are you know trained musicians and uh, have sound equipment that's top of the line and all those types of things and not saying any of those things are bad but um, most of the world doesn't get those things uh, and we devote a lot of those resources here to those things. And just taking a step back and saying, uh, could we do better with our resources? Could, uh, are we focusing on the right thing? Is, is, you know, Jesus commanded us to be disciples to all nations, and yet it's turned more into an evangelism of all peoples. Uh, is that really our calling to just make sure people have a knowledge of. Is, is that what we've been called to or 
is, is it that we're supposed to raise up people in our lives around us that we have daily and weekly uh, relationship with that's beyond um, the Sunday morning hello, uh, that's beyond the uh, theology conversations, you know. We spend a lot of money and time for people to go to college to get Bible degrees, and yet we spend less money and time loving on our neighbor, like you know, the reality of really who our neighbor is. Uh, and that, that has me concerned. When were you saved, and what do you remember about it? Um, that's a great question because I think throughout my life we've, I've had, you know, learnings of uh, what different people view being saved is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from a child, uh, my first experience with what being saved meant was having a prayer with my mom and expressing that Jesus is Lord and uh, confessing with my mouth that uh, he was raised, you know, that I believe that he was raised from the dead and that he was Lord of my life. Um, I believe I had an inkling of an understanding of what that really meant and there was that seed there and that grew and I believe that my heart was in the right place and that's truly therefore why I was saved in my younger life. Um, but as I've gotten older and come to understand what I believe to be more of a, uh, a fuller understanding of, of God and His infinite complexity and infinite simplicity, that He has way more grace and mercy than we could imagine and he has so much more impact on each of us individually than we even give him credit for that we think that it's on us again to evangelize to people that you we have to impart this specific knowledge and then they will be saved but i think god is greater than that and i think that um, again it's through our discipleship uh, that we have been we have been called a disciple and God is the one who truly saves and how that looks for each individual person can be a little bit different but it really comes down to our hearts and uh, our hearts decision on um, what God looks like and how we decide to live with that um, knowledge of who we've learned God to be. Something a little lighter now. Okay. If you had three wishes, mm. what would they be? I think this was actually the one that I was having a lot harder time coming up uh -oh. with an answer with the other day. I mean, you know, I think I'd want world peace and, you know, that food would never be an issue for anybody, you know, that we that hunger and, uh, you know, sickness wouldn't be an issue for people. Um, but I guess uh, comparing this to some of the questions we've had earlier and, and to my experience over the last year, what I'd say my wish would be is that everyone would be able to have an experience like I've had in this last year not necessarily that they be sick because I don't wish that on anyone, but getting to revisit all the relationships that I've had over my life and feel the outpouring of love and compassion from people throughout my life. Um, it's been overwhelming. Uh, to have people by my side and people who go out of their way to help and to be with me and to care for me, whether it be physically or emotionally or spiritually. 
I just, I wish that every person could have that experience. That would be another example of what cancer has taught you. Mm. Now you know what is important. Mm. What's your favorite thing to do? My favorite thing to do is to have conversations with people and okay. even end up in disagreements and arguments and, and, uh, find uh, resolutions to uh, difficult problems, um, whether they be spiritual problems or whether they be um, people problems or uh, political problems. Uh, we have so much to teach each other and sometimes we don't give each other enough credit to actually sit and really listen to somebody else and hear them out to to say, to ask the questions to say, I really want to understand where you're coming from because you I mean, people have spent time thinking about why they've reached an opinion or why they do something the way they do. Um, we should honor them at least in trying to understand why they've reached that decision and, and empathize with that position. And I think that that helps us as people be able to come together to actually find a legitimate answer or conclusion to solve problems amongst each other. What do you wish you were better at? Mm, I think I, and the, I end think, that with at. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll overlook that. Um, I think I tried to answer this one earlier with the, I wish I was more emotive with uh, my appreciation. Okay. Yeah, so I think I answered that one earlier okay. through that. Who are your best friends and why? Um, Henry and Jerry. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, uh, no, um, my two best friends are uh, TJ Norman and Ben Wilson, um, and they have been friends. TJ and I have been friends for over thirty years now, and Ben and I for twenty-five ish, a little more. Um, and they are my best friends because of pretty much everything we've talked about, and that is that we can get together and have the difficult life conversations um, and know that on the other end of them, we're still gonna be friends, even if we disagree, even if we have a completely different opinion, even if we want to uh, do c completely different things that would have different outcomes and results. Um, we know that we have each other's back and that we care about each other, we'd be there for each other and um, yeah. What a blessing. Yeah. Some people have not, could even say one friend that's mm. like that. You've yeah. got at least two. Mm -hmm. And I know a few others. Yes. Definitely, definitely more than those two goofballs, yeah. but. Yeah. Okay. What would you consider a good day if your health was not an issue? Hmm. You were strong and out of pain and mm -hmm. not sick. Mm -hmm. A good day would be, you know, waking up with the sun and having uh, a nice meal with my wife and family and friends and uh, having a nice breakfast conversation about what we're going to do for the day as far as... Uh, you know, the adventures we might be going on, um, you know, whether it be an activity of, you know, let's go rock climbing or surfing or swimming or something active and how we could include other people in that activity. And then also, um, uh, having, you know, good lunch. I like food, food's important to me. So uh, 
uh, get, sharing that meal over the lunchtime, just relaxing where we could talk about um, uh, life and politics and love and uh, and then you know just again spending the whole whole day with people that would be that would be a dream day where you know it would be filled with activities of doing things maybe playing games eating food and and talking um, and then you know rolled into that uh, the element of uh, having new people come into that fold of you know maybe it's somebody who just hasn't had a, had that friend or haven't hasn't had uh, some of the opportunities that we've all had um, and sharing the joy and the love that we all have for each other with other people is absolutely uh, a key element in a good day so now something very important is how did you meet your wife and what's your story I almost feel like she needs to be here to help with part of the story but I guess I can tell it myself okay, okay. Um, so uh, she was working at Costco and I believe the first time I remember seeing her she had on this very yellow bright outfit and I had gone through the checkout and uh, so um, she was the cashier, so I get to be the one to say that she was checking me out first. <laughs> I think you'd already done that. <laughs> so, um, uh, but the the notable time when we actually really met, um, she was at the security uh, on the way out the door where you hand them your receipt. And I handed her my receipt and she looked at me and said, root beer? Questioningly. And so I thought she was asking where the root beer was on, on my cart. And so I had it underneath on the bottom part. And so I pointed underneath and pointed it out to her. And uh, she said, no, what is root beer? <laughs> and so I did the, the smoothest thing possible. I just stared at her and thought to myself, who in the world does not know what root beer is? And she so. She, after staring at each other for a few seconds, she said, uh, um, I mean, can you get drunk off it? And I said, oh, no, it's a sugary carbonated beverage. And so she said, oh, OK. Um, and so um, I went out to my car and sat down, pack, you know, packed up my car, sat down and thought to myself a second, ah, maybe I should get a root beer and my business card and just go hand it to her. And. Uh, just had one of those kind of, uh, you know, prayerful thoughts that you ever occasionally have. And it came into my mind, Alex, you're 26 years old and what you've done so far hasn't worked yet. So I grabbed a root beer and my business card and went back in and uh, handed her the root beer and my business card and just said, you know, uh, let, just give me a call and let me know if you like it. That's it. And her her uh, fellow employee encouraged her to take the root beer, like it, well, that it wasn't that big a deal, because technically they aren't allowed to accept things from customers. So, uh, so she ended up uh, going home and uh, looking me up on online, with through my business card and checking out to make sure I was actually a, a music instructor. And so she was interested in taking lessons, which is why she didn't throw my card away. And she tried the root beer and didn't like it, so she was calling to let me know that she didn't like it, and then she got nervous and hung up. Um, but I worked at a job where I was on call 24-7 for emergencies at an apartment building, and so I had to call the number back immediately to just make sure there wasn't it wasn't an emergency issue. And she picked up, and we talked, and hit it off, and that's how it all started. And continued. Yes. Okay. What does your ideal missions trip look like? Hmm. Yeah, um, so we've, Lolo and I, Maganda and I, uh, my friends and I, we've had conversations about missions trips and I've been on a few and, uh, you know, kind of have an idea of, of how those were structured. Obviously, I haven't been on all of them, so there's potentially some some out there that maybe are doing kind of this already, but 
Um, missions trips are a tricky uh, thing because what we're doing from uh, the perspective of coming from the United States and going to another country is potentially saying, I get to go on a trip and spend all this money uh, on a plane ticket and my food and all these things. And then we go there and spend a week or two evangelizing uh, to people who we probably will never see again in our lives. Um, the other things that incorporate get incorporated into trips are, you know, going and building buildings for people. And, you know, maybe there is some expertise needed here to help with that. Um, but the reality is a lot of times there's so much money and time that is spent um, kind of indulging us to get our experience that we end up not helping the economic structure of where we're going to say, hey, there's people here who actually do construction work that could use this money in this job. And then we end up actually taking that job away from them because we're offering to do it for free. And so in the effect of trying to do something that's kind and helpful, we actually end up causing uh, more problems by taking away some of those jobs. Um, the other parts that get tied up into that is, you know, the good elements are on a missions trip, you get to meet and see the needs of people who live differently than you do. But again, we're still this buffer zone. There's this removal where you don't really get to experience what it's like to sleep in the cardboard box that's wet or to have to have fire ants crawling on you all night um, because you're in a comfortable hotel room, which is typically what would happen in a missions environment. Or, you know, that you know what it's like to live in their circumstance where they work 12 hours today just to provide their only meal for the day. And yet we think because we saw it, we think because that moved us, that that puts us in a position to help them in the best way possible. And that's really dangerous. Um, so ideally one of the things I thought of would be neat to have a, a missions trip to kind of maybe switch some of those experiences and burdens and things around would be to create an environment here in the United States where people could experience what it's like to live in a third world country where we would have them work on a farm for 12 hours where they would make just enough money to have one meal where they would have a budget um, to understand how impossible it is to work yourself out of poverty. Um, there's so many misconceptions about poverty where people say if they just worked harder, if they applied themselves, if they had the right education, it's hard to communicate those things without a proper experience of actually knowing going through it. It's just the only way to really truly understand. So um, to create an experience like that, I think would be very eye-opening. And then that money that was gonna be set aside for plane tickets and hotels and airfares and um, taxi rides and experiences, getting to try out you know, the food and all of that, that could all be set aside and actually be sent over to missionaries who are in those countries to actually um, move in to help build up the infrastructure um, of those people who need it, to help kids go to school, to help um, with food, uh, to help um, create businesses there that could be international businesses. You know, one of the biggest problems with poverty is uh, there are many businesses that are in poverty areas, but their business is to impoverished people. 
how much money can you make off of someone who doesn't have money? You can't. So I know a goal has always been to create and plant international type businesses in impoverished communities so that they could sell goods internationally because then people from the United States could pay a United States price to inject that economic stimulus into impoverished communities and countries. Whereas right now, you know, the idea of charity is we'll send them free things. And that's another dangerous thing where, you know, if you look at countries like Haiti, for example, I think we're still sending them free rice from when they had that devastating hurricane 10 years ago or more. And, you know, what that's done is put all the rice producers in Haiti out of business because you can't compete with free rice. So um, we need to be diligent in understanding the implications of our giving and understanding that, you know, you don't send winter clothes to the Philippines. That just adds to their trash. They're a tropical country, you know. Um, now there are colder areas that need blankets and coats. They're, that is true, but, you know, they don't need cocktail dresses. They don't need high-heeled shoes necessarily, you know. Maybe some of them might appreciate it, but the reality is we need to be diligent about what we send and not just send them our garbage and say, oh, we're blessing them with our garbage. So I think I could probably talk about that for a lot longer. So maybe the I'll... The idea of doing something here in the States to make a comparable experience. Right. Take the money yeah. and actually use it for those that need it. Right. That's all sound pretty brilliant to me. You better write that stuff down. <laughs> well, I've talked about it with enough people, but yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Because as long as we give, they, they still are victims. Right. That's yep. what's happening in our welfare system in the right. United States. Yep. Yep. So, how are you doing? Okay, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're about to the end. Okay. All right. Who is Alex Seaman? Mm. And who are you when no one's around? Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's um, uh, so I guess we're going for what I hope people say of me and what I think of myself, maybe. I would probably, what you tell yourself is mm -hmm. not to your advantage most of the time. Mm -hmm. You know, all the negative junk we tell ourselves. Mm. So maybe I should go and ask these guys. <laughs> Who is yeah, maybe we could do that. You guys could come here and sit after and give it a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Um, all right. If I had to give a short synopsis of who is Alex, I guess what I aspire to be um, is to be open-minded about every situation because I know there's no way I could possibly be the most knowledgeable. There's no way I could ever have attained uh, a skill set or a knowledge beyond anyone who's ever existed. Um, so in, I guess in a sense it's like I want to keep myself humble to the possibility that I am wrong at all times because that's one of the hardest things to be okay with. It's hard to be okay with being wrong. Um, one of the things that I tell myself in that is it is so much easier though in reality to be wrong than it is to be right. Because if I'm wrong, the only person's mind that I need to change is mine. If I'm right and everyone else is wrong, that is a whole different ballgame. Because then 
I have to convince everyone else that they're wrong. So if you can find the things that you got wrong and can change those, man, that's a whole lot easier. You save yourself a lot of energy. And eternity will provide you with all the knowledge you can take on for the rest for eternity. You're going to learn. Mm. And so all these things that you've been striving for, you'll be surprised what you're going to find out very quickly when you get there. Yeah, we'll see what. And um, of, of all things, how do you want to be remembered? Um, I mean, I guess I hope I'm remembered as a, a servant, um, someone who looked for ways to help build people, um, that when people left their time with me that they felt empowered to um, accomplish things um, and that they would also walk away challenged. Um, obviously that can't happen every time you meet somebody, but that at least at some point I would have challenged a way of their thinking. Um, a way of how they perceive the world, a way of how they perceive God, a way of how they perceive others. Um, so I guess some people might just call that ornery. <laughs> open-minded? <laughs> yeah. You're definitely open-minded. Yeah. And I, and I hope that people even would say I was too open-minded. You think that's possible to be too open-minded? Well, I think people can. Th I think people can think that about other people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I would want to be that borderline where. You know, people would say, "Ah, that that's maybe even too far." I think I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. That we need to push ourselves to. Understand, so much that it should be uncomfortable. Well, I have certainly benefited by sitting here listening to you. Thank you. And that's certainly what I would say about you. You, ch you challenge, you care. Um, so I have enjoyed this. And one other thing I would like to tell you is that when, you, when it is time for you to leave this earth, don't worry about it. Because I've been with many people. And angels come. Mm -hmm. And you are far from being alone. And it's a very beautiful thing. Hmm. So don't be afraid. Thank you. I, I guess uh, I, I don't feel like I've been afraid. Okay. But I, I'm, I just don't want to miss out mm -hmm. on the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, that's the, my only thing that I am sad about. Is I feel like I'll miss. You miss the only things we know here. This is what we know. Well, creating more memories and experiences. Because <laughs> those are the things I cherish. Um, you know, uh, people have, have always asked, how can I help? What can I do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people ask, what can I give? And uh, I've just been at this place long enough to know it's like I am going to miss creating those new memories mm -hmm. with everybody. That's. It is hard to walk away from the only thing you've known and go to the unknown. I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised. Is there anything else that you, as you went through our list, is there anything else that you would like to add?
I just want to make sure everybody knows how much I love you. Um, even though I, I know I'll be with God, just that still physical separation from being with you, I will miss you terribly. And I will look forward to eternity. And I know, I think it'll be easier for me because I'll just get to turn around and see you after I get there because time won't matter as much, but I wish I could have, yeah, made more memories with you all. Please uh, love on each other and care about each other. Um, Always look for ways. Talk about the ways that you can be more kind and more loving. That, yeah, you can share with your neighbor, that you can share with your family, that you can share with your friends. When you pass that person on the street who needs help, do more than just toss a coin in the cup. Ask them about their life. Get to know their name. Challenge yourself to dig deeper than what you think you should. Jesus said, if someone asks you to walk a mile, one, one mile with them, walk, walk another. Do that. Thank you. Thanks for your help. What was the question again? Who is Alex? To me, Alex uh, has always been a rock to me. Uh, a friend, a best friend that I can count on uh, for anything. Uh, when I've struggled, he's always been there. Uh, when I've needed answers to something or a question answered or you know advice about something of uh, relationship or, you know, different things work um, has always been somebody that I can go to and count on for any kind of advice and he would give it to me <laughs> very truthfully sometimes too truthfully um, and he's just been uh, a person that's caring beyond anybody that I've ever met in my entire life um, and one to show me or to correct me in ways that nobody else has or uh, done in the past uh, from different things uh, that I shouldn't have been doing or doing uh, wrong. He's always been one to uh, be real and honest and correct and, and lead in a way that um, true friendship is, uh, true brotherhood, uh, somebody who's not afraid to uh, correct or uh, to to always bring out the best in people. Um, that's who I think Alex is, is striving to bring out the best in everybody um, and uh, showing them that they can do better. Uh, even if they're doing a good job, always uh, striving, man, there could, do be, there could be more you could be doing. There, you could be doing this or you could be doing better with that. Um, and that's one thing I, I love about Alex and uh, you know, I'm going to cherish and try to live out that, try to live out that legacy of trying to do better and uh, pushing people to do better um, and just learning from that. So that's what I've, that's who I know Alex to be, um, that true friend, no matter what, through the thick and the, through the thin and always And always being there for everybody, and uh, those memories are are, are going to be going to be cherished forever. <laughs> so that's good. Who is Alex? <clears throat> well, 
Alex is a um, a loved child of God. And uh, everybody goes through certain situations in their life to kind of shape them into certain things. And uh, for Alex, um, the big part of his life, the, the thing that has shaped him the most, I feel like, is the, the real revelation of, of what, how important love is and how important true love is. Um, that's always something that comes up in conversations and, and, and things that are important in life. And it comes up in, in every conversation we have. Um, he's always been the one to push for relationship, um, even if, you know, I didn't always push back on that. He's been, always been the one to want to, to be there, want to be present, um, want to build a, a relationship up. And, uh... Also, I'll second what TJ said. Uh, very truthful, you know. There's not a lot of people in in my life that might give you very truthful feedback on whether it be a song that you wrote or whatever. Um, but Alex would he would give you very truthful feedback. Uh, maybe negative, maybe positive, but it would be true to him. And uh, that was, that's important. And that's a, a great character for somebody to have, a, a great thing to, for somebody to have in their character. Um, but overall, I would say what shaped him the most and the path that he has been led on is driven by love and driven by that connection with people and relationship. Um, yeah, probably more than, well, definitely more than any other friend in my life pushing for that uh, at every chance. So I think that's that's who Alex is. Um, most devastatingly truthful comment I've ever made. To us? Yeah. This one be for me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was dating a girl, and you're like, you should not be dating her. And I bucked that so hard. And I tried and tried to make it work. And you knew and were very honest with me that I was not supposed to be dating this person. And I tell that story to uh, even the youth kids, even today. Um, I use you as an example of listening to those people around you and your friends and true friends around you and man i i lost you know years of that relationship i shouldn't have been in and that was one of the most truthful and honest things that you uh you told me and you were very honest and very blatant about you know that i was doing something i shouldn't have been doing and it was very honest and very true and it was correct you know obviously in the end so that's a one i've shared quite a few times with people and uh, even to Liz too, and um, you know, after the fact, and she always sticks out to me that Alex is like, "You should be dating her." And I didn't listen <laughs> until the end, obviously. But it was tough. I should have done that. Should have done more. Um, the most, how'd you put it, Devast devastatingly, devastatingly truthful. truthful comment yeah. or feedback it mine's less dire than yours <laughs> um i'm there's probably been others but as we all know i can't remember a whole lot of things it's a true story um so i will mention it has to do with music uh it wasn't that long ago when you were in the when you were in the hospital in iowa city um and you watched our live show for, it was in des moines right. And uh, then I think we came back to visit you at, at the hospital. 
And and actually, I feel like maybe even Cassie said she wanted some feedback from you. Yeah. Somehow that happened. Yeah. And uh, you were just given like really good feedback to us that wasn't all positive, you know? <laughs> I think I remember you saying there was a time when I, I was playing guitar and I would like, I was giving it like some flair or something. I was like, I was like lifting it up or something. And then I think you said at that point, Alex was like, I'm not watching this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not watching this. <laughs> I think I was listening. I don't want a visual anymore. So love that. And then um, you were giving us some real honest feedback about uh, our voices, how they blended together, you know, um, some real specific things um, that we could work on. And they were good. They were, it was good feedback. Yeah. By the way, I've been working on singing with vibrato. It's been, uh, it's been weird, but yeah. yeah. So good feedback. Yeah. I would say that. Nice. Yeah. Yes, All right. All right. I got one sim simple question that I was thinking about. Uh, I'll give you a scenario. You are completely alone. Um, you know, everybody's off doing something. Your wife's running an errand. Everybody's gone. Mm -hmm. You're alone at the house. What are you doing in that time when nobody's around? Or what are you? What's going? What are you thinking about? And not necessarily in the context of this last year, but in general, just as a person in mm -hmm. that alone time. What are you doing? And what are you thinking about? Mm. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, this could be even in the context that you're talking about, you know, I, when I would drive to different job sites, um, you know, I think the typical thing is radio or some music on or listening to something. Um, I'd say probably at least 50% of the time no music, no radio, um, nothing, you know, if I guess I was home alone, um, I, you know, I might be probably watching Netflix or something like that, but then, you know, it'd be a documentary or something and it would, so this all ties together in the sense that, um, you know, if I was listening to the radio on, in the car ride, it would be, you know, probably like a uh, public radio. So, uh, so typically, you know, some, some topic would come up that I would um, hear or be concerned about or um, start wondering about. And then I would just be in that quiet or in the stillness and think about that topic and try to uh, evaluate what my current position is on it, why it's that way. Uh, and then I would take it from there and probably um, backtrack it and say, well, you know, I know other people view it this way. Why do they view it that way? Uh, so I'd say, you know, a lot of that time was spent philosophically reevaluating my positions on things, you know, um, trying to not just be okay with this is my opinion, it's what it is, and that's it. Um, in fact, uh, one of the things I really like to challenge myself to do was to prove myself wrong, almost, you know? Where like, I, I hold a certain viewpoint and instead of like hopping online or trying to find resources or whatever that validate that position, I would try to hop on and find things that invalidated that position, you know, cause I want to understand like, you know, if I, if that's my position, I feel like, well, then I probably understand that part of it pretty well. So that means I don't probably understand the other part of it that well. So I would want to understand why, you know, and, and I, so I spent lots of time looking up things like, you know, 
abortion like what what parts of that like what aspects of that you know i know there are good people out there who are loving and compassionate and caring who are saying that pro choice is important for women well well let's like i need to break this down i need to understand why a loving caring compassionate person could feel so strongly about that when i feel the opposite and i think i'm a loving caring compassionate person what's the disconnect like what what am i missing that they saw or what am i what piece of information or what experience did they have that gave them that different perspective um and sometimes i would find it and sometimes i wouldn't you know uh you know like that's definitely one i still struggle with um but i'm still going to try because there's you know some something that convinced someone enough to have a different opinion uh so they have to i mean it, i can't just write people off as stupid and be like you know oh they just don't care or they got have all bad sources or all you know uh that just doesn't uh make sense in this larger scheme of things if you're being really truthful and honest with yourself about how other people think, you know. It's good. So still trying to learn or evaluate your own opinions in life when you're chilling at home. Yeah. He's real now. All right, this would be a question that even just as a, what would you want to tell your parents about your life, or what is what's something that you would want your parents to know? Um, I mean, I want my parents to know that they are. I am so grateful for them. Um, I am so lucky to have had the life that I've had and a large reason why is because of them. I mean, I've had so many opportunities and so many experiences that most people throughout history have never even got to experience. Um, you know, I, I never remember having to be worried about resources or uh, anything. And I never had to worry about um, what, what if, you know, this bad thing happened, would my family no longer accept me or love me or care or care about me or you know what would they think about me if you know I, I never felt like I was ever in a position where um, I could lose their love and so I I trust that I trust them I trust their love um, you know I learned a lot about loving people and from them, you know, uh, they, they taught us what love is growing up. They didn't just, you know, through experience, through doing and, you know, by bringing in the foster kids, by bringing in, um, people who, uh, have different life experiences, you know, showing us how different life can be, yet how close together we are as people, um, and that how, how, how simple it is for someone to just have a completely different life because of their parents, who their parents are, or where they grew up, what side of a border they grew up on, you know? So I'm, I'm extremely lucky. What about your brothers and sisters what would you want to say um, well there's a lot of you um, so I'm hoping we'll get some individual time to talk here soon 
Um, so just in general as a whole, like, you know, I've always known that my siblings love me, you know, uh, even though we have had arguments or fights or that we've had differences of opinion or differences of beliefs or whatever, I knew that I know, always have known that they love me and we just had different ways of, uh, getting, uh, through tough times, different ways of handling situations, different ways of um, talking through things. And so that's okay, you know. We're, we're all very different people, but I've always felt loved by them, even through um, those times that were difficult or frustrating. So I want them to know that, that I love them and I'm so proud of all of them and happy with, you know, how amazing people they've turned out to be, that they're, you know, loving, compassionate people who, who, you know, care about others. Like, and what, what more could you want from having brothers and sisters than ones who want to help you and join you in those things? You know, they've, they've always shown an appreciation for wanting to you know, help others. So, good, good family. Mm -hmm. Some good parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't want it to feel like you're answering the same things again and again. No. Uh, but what a, would you? What about Lolo? Mm -hmm. You... Yeah, I thought there were more questions on the list. I'm not sure. Uh, so thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, what would you say to a Lolo? Um, I don't even know if... I mean, I know that people, when they have an opportunity to talk to her and hear a little bit about her life or a little bit about her experiences. I feel like they just get a taste of how, how deep her love for people runs. And I don't think that, I don't think that um, everyone has even, I, I don't know many other people, I mean, I know she probably has some friends, but I hope that everyone takes a little more time to talk to her about because she won't freely give this information. You kind of have to pry it out of her about her experience. Um, but she is beyond a doubt the most generous, compassionate, kind, loving person I've ever met in my life. And deciding that I wanted to marry her was the easiest decision of my life. Um, when other people talk about how they were nervous or scared about their wedding or they had any sort of hesitations or whatever, I do not understand at all. I don't, I did not have any of that. Um, she blows me away with how her, how deep her reservoir is for people and that alone like has it makes her the most outstanding person I've ever known. <laughs>